So hi, everyone. Welcome to Netflix at 4 p.m. if you're in the UK or whatever other time zone you're in. It is my great pleasure to introduce longtime friend and colleague, Alex Howard. It's very rare that you interview somebody in the afternoon that interviewed you in the morning, but actually that happened to Alex and I today. So Alex Howard is the founder and CEO of the Optimum Health Clinic, one of the world's leading integrative medicine clinics specializing in fatigue and related conditions. The Optimum Health Clinic's team of 20 full-time practitioners have worked with thousands of patients in over 40 countries and have conducted a randomized control trial that is currently underway in its groundbreaking approach to treating fatigue. Alex is also the host of the Super, the Fatigue Super Conference, creator of the first, uh, sorry, of the 12 week reset program and creator of the therapeutic coaching methodology. So he's a busy person. His first book, Why Me, was published in 2003, and he has published theoretical papers in journals such as the British Medical Journal Open and Psychology and Health. And this year, he's also launching Trauma and Mind Body Super Trauma and Mind Body Super Conference. So he's just full of energy and life, which I think is not only ironic but very heartwarming for somebody whose original story began around chronic fatigue. So it'd be lovely, Alex, if you could tell us a bit about how you got into working with fatigue, including your personal journey. Sure, Heather. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's like re role reversal. I was interviewing you this morning. Um, you mentioned the Trauma and Mind Body Super Conference, which is happening in June. So um, I've spent much of the last um, sort of month sort of perfectly timed in uh, in lockdown interviewing other people. So it's, it's interesting to be on the other side of the equation. Um, so, yeah, I had I mean, my interest in fatigue is because I suffered from chronic fatigue as a teenager. And, you know, it was a enormously challenging and difficult um, experience. I think like anyone that goes through a personal journey like that, you know, I was looking for answers in all of the obvious places and simply couldn't find them. You know, I saw, I think, 30 different uh, doctors, medical practitioners, and sort of each time walking into that kind of consultation and thinking, this is going to be the time that someone can help me get out of this. And it didn't happen. And I think like anybody that goes on a journey like that, I was really forced to have to find my own way out. Hmm. And what was that way out, Alex? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. You know, there was, um, there was no one answer. I think that's, that's part of it. I think there was a very physical element in terms of what was happening and that was you know and that's formed a big part of the work that we do here um at the optimum health clinic you know in terms of oh we just lost alex um hold on one second because obviously i need to get him back give me just one moment my apologies um i'm not sure what happened i'm gonna just put myself on mute
Oh, here you are. Heather, sorry. Can you can you see and hear me? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Sorry, I we're we're in this country cottage in the middle of the countryside, and we seem to get these sudden internet issues that sort of drop in and, and drop out. Um, I've switched to a cabled connection, so hopefully hopefully it's better now. Um, I know this has nothing to do with the talk, but just for some comic relief from everybody, there's somebody in my phone, Alex H, and I assumed it was you, so I rang that person, but it's not that it's not <laughs> <laughs> that person had no idea who I was. Anyway, right. continuing on. Yeah, so I was I was I was just saying that there is a there's very much a physical element to these conditions. Mm -hmm. And there's a psycho emotional element. And I think part of what was so challenging for me at that time was I'd been very much raised in the tradition that you get ill and you take a pill and you go to your doctor and you, they say what's wrong and you describe your symptoms. And there's a clear treatment path that, that comes from that. And I think what was so challenging was going in and saying, I feel fatigued all of the time. I, I have fatigue, which is chronic, getting a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome and sort of thinking, well, putting syndrome on the end doesn't really make it a diagnosis. Like really, what's wrong with me? Why is it wrong with me? And how do I find a path to, to get better? And so over that sort of initial period, I went and saw different practitioners and my grandmother was sort of very motivated um, and interested in alternative health and sort of dragged me around these, these different people. But nothing worked. And I think for many people that have been on health journeys, that's often the case initially, that you're trying all these different things and you sort of, you invest. And I remember going into certain things and I would read the, you know, it's kind of leaflets back in those days. It was sort of pre-internet. You sort of read the leaflet and there always seemed to be a chronic fatigue syndrome story in the in the leaflet. And I would read it and I'd be so excited thinking this was the thing that was finally gonna, gonna make a difference. And so I would go and I would invest hope and then it wouldn't often make the difference that it needed to, to make. And so a couple of years went on like this and then I, I sort of reached a point of, of rock bottom. And I had a conversation with my my uncle who was a little bit, um, I don't know if you ever saw, I'm sure he did Lord of the Rings. It was a bit like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings that he wasn't there very often, but he just sort of seemed to turn up at just the right moment, have the right words of wisdom and then sort of disappear um, into the horizon again. And in this conversation, he really helped me realize that if I wanted the situation to change that I was going to have to on some level take responsibility and I was going to have to do something about it um, and just sort of passively going and trying different things and investing the sort of hope in someone else having the answers that I would have to somehow be proactive in in that process and that that's so that was because even though not everybody's journey listening right now is going to be about chronic fatigue I think that that is so important for people right now that are struggling to be aware of the tendency to want to outsource our own well being and hearing this message from you and starting to take back control, self efficacy. So please continue. Yeah, and it's a hard thing to do. You know, I was 18 years old at this point and I'd had chronic fatigue for a couple of years and it was, it felt like, how can I possibly at 18 years old? find answers to this condition that all of these experts are supposed to have the answers to. Mm. But I also think, and I sort of reflect actually on um, when I was interviewing you this morning, but I think often when we're the one that's suffering and we're the one that's on the journey, we also have a motivation that's different to, um, to the medical people, that we're living with this thing day to day and we have to find the way to find to find answers. So that catalyzed the sort of five year journey of seeing many, many practitioners, I think at one point taking over something that I wouldn't recommend, but taking over 70 supplements a day. I did thousands of hours of meditation and yoga, went deep into nutrition. Despite my initial um, serious reaction to the idea of there being any psycho-emotional component also got very interested in the potential for 
healing my, you know, myself on a psycho-emotional level to also impact upon health. And there wasn't, there wasn't any one thing. It wasn't like I did this intervention and then everything sort of miraculously improved. There were lots of different pieces and I very much see it. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle and there are different pieces to that jigsaw. And those jigsaw pieces are different for different people. And so in the early years of, um, well, I, I then went and set up the organization that I wanted to exist in the years that I've been ill, the Optimum Health Clinic. And in the early years of the Optimum Health Clinic, people would sort of come and say, I want to do exactly what you did to get better. And what I used to try and say to people is, well, if you did what I did, you probably won't get better because what your body needs is different to what my body um, needed. Um, and that's really what's informed the approach that we've developed over the last um, 17 or so years at the Oxford Health Clinic, that there is no one answer. These fatigue related conditions, which would include uh, ME, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, post-viral fatigue, um, adrenal fatigue, well, that's a kind of controversial term these days, but a kind of collection of um, conditions that have fatigue as a key component. There are many different pieces and putting together that jigsaw has been a sort of been a fascinating process, an enormously complicated process, and often the sort of latest insights and realizations have tended to come from the people who've been the most tricky to work with. And rather than seeing those as sort of people to brush under the carpet and pretend that they don't exist, for us, they've been, how do we learn? How do we improve and refine the approach from that? So if somebody is listening at home, either now or later on YouTube, and they don't have access to the Optimum Health Clinic for whatever reason, whether it's because um, they can't get to online sessions or the actual clinic or whatever it is, where would you suggest that they start? How might they begin this arduous process of unpicking what they uniquely need? So I think the first thing is realizing that there are answers that are out there. And I think actually, before we even come to some of the methodology and some of the principles of it, I think it's very, I, I mentioned sort of the investment of sort of hope in something and that sort of crashing disappointment um, afterwards that often people can become, I wouldn't say negative, but people can become quite cynical or highly cautious about trying anything because they don't want to have that disappointment of investing hope in something that's not working out. And I think sometimes we have to get past that. And I think just finding inspirational stories of people that have be it fatigue related be it other conditions but feeding one's mind with the idea that it is possible to find a path out and one of the things that we've done over the last however many years is put out a lot of patient stories on youtube in various places so people can first start to shift some of those those ideas and, and, and those beliefs but to come to the the map so we we talk about um, seven S's, like, and each of these is a different category of pieces that, that we need to pay attention to. So I'll just sort of list them out briefly, and then perhaps we can dive into a few of them in, in a bit more detail. So the first thing, well, the first four are related to how does someone get fatigue of some sort in the first place. So the first is straws. We all know this phrase, it's the final straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm -hmm. those straws are the external trauma to use to use a word traumas or events or loads that have been placed upon us through our lifetime they could be um physiological in origin so viruses um different things our bodies had to deal with they could also be psycho-emotional that could be anything from you know childhood attachment trauma to sexual abuse to the micro traumas of subtle things and loads that happen to someone in life. But you've got those external straws, like those loads that someone's had in, in their life. And rarely is that alone enough. Like normally these other bits I'm going to come to are also part of the picture. But also rarely do you see a case study of fatigue where there haven't been some kind of loads or straws that have happened at various points in, in someone's life. The second is subtypes. So if straws are external things that happen to us, subtypes are 
our sort of internal um, psycho-emotional and physiological um, patterns of how we've related to the world. So psychologically, things like um, an achiever pattern where we define our self-worth by what we do and what we achieve. So we're always demanding more of ourselves. We're always pushing ourselves harder. Um, and we can perhaps come to more of these subtypes in a little bit. Um, on a physical level, things like an immune subtype where someone's always had a sensitive immune system, perhaps right from, um, from being a child and their immunity has, has been more delicate and vulnerable perhaps than the average person. So you have these straws, like these external events you then have these subtypes, like these internal um, patterns or sometimes deficiencies or vulnerabilities. The next thing is you have your own genetic signature. We all have different genetics and there is some evidence to suggest that even things like chronic fatigue, there is some genetic correlation. It's not necessarily that strong, but if we look at some of the recent work on genetic SNPs and we can see that it's much more nuanced than just being, this is the gene for fatigue, but there are certain genes that make people more sensitive in, in certain ways. Um, we then have systems like the bodily systems which are impacted by these pieces. So you've got the straws, the external events, you've got the subtypes, how your system is responding, you've got your genetic signature, You've then got the systems that become impacted. So, for example, um, someone's digestive system. Someone might have um, anything from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO um, to parasites to um, deficient levels of HCL or digestive enzymes. But you start to have some um, imbalances in certain bodily systems. Another example might be in the immune system. Someone might have had the external straw or load of Lyme disease, but they also have um, other impacts, perhaps from co-infections or other impacts that are happening on, on the system. Mm -hmm. So to sort of map, sort of to make sense of how someone's got to the particular point they're at, we want to understand what are those straws? What are those external events that have happened? What are the... Um, subtypes like their internal response to those what's their genetic signature and what are the systems that have been impacted by doing that we're then building a map we're sort of solving the puzzle like what are the different pieces of um of that jigsaw and then just to kind of complete this this piece and then we can perhaps go into some of these in a bit more detail we're then looking at state for the body to heal we have to be in a healing state and if we're in a state of what we call maladaptive stress response or ramped up nervous system, then you can do everything else right, but the body's not going to use it in, in the right way. We then map three different stages to the recovery process and different things, different interventions are helpful at different stages and how we manage activity level is also determined by the stage we're at. Finally, we have the sequence. The interventions that we do at different stages of the recovery, different interventions are effective or not. So we need to sequence the way that, that we do that. So I appreciate that even we're simplifying it into straws, subtypes, systems, signature, state, stages and sequence, it's still quite a lot of pieces. But from a kind of practitioner point of view, what that then helps us do is mapping someone against that or sort of solving that puzzle. Then this enormous sort of body of data and different protocols and um, interventions that we might use then get organized within that. I love this analogy factorial model that you're using. And I think it's really the way that we need to go with medicine overall, because we are so comprehensive as beings with so many different factors that make up our health or the lack thereof. And if we really want to help somebody to heal, whether it's from chronic fatigue or something else, we are recognizing as medicine is moving into its next generation that it has to be biopsychosocial and at the same time, very person-centered. And you're doing that, but in a way that is systematic. So like you said, you can capture data. Now, something I'm very curious about that relates right now to the pandemic is many people have the conception 
but there is a relationship between mental health issues and chronic fatigue. And I'm hearing that, you know, there are going to be different straws and traits and uh, immunological factors. Do you think that we're going to be seeing more chronic fatigue syndrome and other conditions that you've named as a result of this pandemic? Yes, is the, is the honest answer. Um, and I think sort of how you have to think about this is that if we take the map that I, that I outlined, really what you're talking about is too much of an overload of external things and vulnerability in, in, in the bodily sort of system. So you could talk about it like the pandemic is a massive straw, like it's a massive load that, and you know, and that's not, I, I don't think we really mean necessarily if you get COVID-19, you either recover or you don't, but it's much more all the other impacts in terms of job stress and relationship stress and sort of uncertainty and all the stuff that sort of goes with that. But you could also look at it from a subtype point of view that if you've got an achiever pattern or let's say a helper pattern, one of the other patterns or an anxiety pattern, they're more likely to play out in a situation of great stress. So for example, let's say one's career is under threat. How does one deal with that? If you have an achiever pattern, you work harder, you push yourself for longer. Um, if we look at it from the point of view of bodily systems, if someone's got already got, let's say, some vulnerability in their immune system, let's say every winter, they find themselves going down with sort of bug after bug. And they just sort of just about managed to deal with that and work through it. But, you know, it's a sort of, it's, it's a struggle, let's say. More load on that system means that perhaps this winter or the winter after, the load gets too much. And then suddenly what you find is it moves from a sort of healthy person with low immunity that struggles to a person that actually is not managing to maintain the struggle and actually they end up with a more persistent let's say fatigue that comes in and I think perhaps an important point to make here as well is I don't really subscribe to the idea although I think labels are obviously helpful for, for various reasons mm -hmm. I see fatigue very much as a continuum so you've sort of got um Olympic athlete level energy like super vitality sort of let's say here and then you've got bed bound with severe um, hypersensitive ME chronic fatigue sort of over here. So it's not like a binary, you've got chronic fatigue or fatigue or you don't, it's sort of whereabouts you are on that continuum. And so more people are gonna be, have more stress and overload to deal with. So they're more pushed down towards that, that fatigue side of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I know that your approach is all about not giving an umbrella suggestion to everybody. But obviously, one of the things that HealthFlix is really trying to do is to help people to cope that aren't feeling well right now, and to also help people that are kind of teetering on the edge from falling over that precipice. And I wonder if you might make some suggestions for people that they can engage in, and maybe even for some of these subtypes, so that they're less likely to have fatigue on a spectrum that's going to be severe and enduring. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's um, As I might mentioned to you previously, I'm actually currently writing a mm -hmm. book on the approach. And part of the challenge is that normally with books like this, you define a clear approach, like these are the foods you eat, these are the practices you do. And it's, 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 I think it's probably become clear already from this interview, I just don't subscribe to that way of doing things. And so, but there are core principles or core themes that are really important. And the first thing I would say that there are people that are watching this that don't have chronic fatigue, they just feel more fatigued than they otherwise um, perhaps should, to realize that that is a message or a communication from your body, which needs to be honored. It's not something to, um, what tends to happen is people feel fatigued and because there isn't general societal kind of acceptance of that, people just sort of force through and push through. And there's a sort of, um, a lot of cultural support for the idea of almost celebrating how hard one pushes themselves. So the first thing I would say is you have to listen to your body. And if your body is feeling fatigued or you're feeling your energy is not where it should be, the, the solution is not just push harder. 
In fact, if you push harder, all you will do is you will push yourself further in to that fatigue. So you have to listen to your body. And if you've been through significant, like when I was talking about the, the model and you're thinking straws, oh my God, I can think of all these things that have happened. Well, it takes your body time to heal. Like if you think about, for example, the current um, situation and, and just at the front line, you've got in certain pockets in, in the country, for example, you've got healthcare workers working far longer days under far more stress than they normally would. That's going to take time to recover from that, for the body to, to, re, like, to re-find its balance on, on the other side. So I'm a very strong advocate of this idea that we need to work with the body. It's not mind over matter. It's not if you feel tired, you just need to work harder and get motivated. It's quite the opposite. You're probably trying to motivate yourself too much. And the fatigue is the response to that. I think part of what also is really important with this is for the body to heal. The body has to be in a healing state. Also, to be able to listen to your body, you actually have to have your nervous system calm enough that you can actually feel the, sig the signals and the communications. And when we're so wired and conditioned in a sense in our mind and we're so much on the sort of doing 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 thing we tend to do whatever we can to avoid or distract ourselves away from the body's communications or to numb ourselves to use you know caffeine or sugar or you know recreational drugs or whatever it is to try to change those communications so we need to actually in a sense, we need to have a sort of ground zero, like actually, where is my body? To listen to that, and then to respond to that based upon that. And some of the things that that might involve, that might involve taking more rest, if we're talking preventatively here. It may well involve looking at diet and nutrition. One of the things that tends to happen with fatigue is we tend to get used to having more and more stimulants to keep us going. So more coffee, more sugar, uh, more carbohydrates. So we're kind of, um, we're using that as a way to prop up our energy. So for many people moving to, and this, I know this may be controversial to some people, but moving to um, a higher protein diet, often a stone age or paleo diet is the diet that certainly everyone's different, but has the mo most generic benefit that, that we've observed over, you know, well over 10,000 patients. Um, practices like meditation and yoga, but not yoga where one's pushing oneself and going, right, I need to get fit. I need to lose weight. Right. Let's get some Ashtanga or, or kind of hot yoga or whatever, but yoga where you're really slowing things down and you're tuning in and you're listening to your body. And then ideally working with a sort of functional medicine informed practitioner that can start to really understand what is what are the systems that are in fact affected what are what is your unique signature of, of of underlying that fatigue there will be reasons and maybe looking at things like atp production mitochondrial function looking at hormones looking at digestion looking at immune function that really then starting to dig deeper and to get clarity of what's actually going on so thank you for that comprehensive response I'm personally curious. So you talked about the fact that for the body to have energy, it has to be in this healing state. So I wanted to delve for a moment into physiology because that's a great love of mine. Yeah. And to talk about the relaxation response as defined by Herbert Benson. So it's, you know, this physiological state that we enter that is unique in the reduction of metabolic rate and thereby consumption of oxygen at that stage. And since the early 2000s at the Benson Henry Institute at Harvard, they've been researching how when an individual enters this stage or state, they can alter genetic expression. And in fact, around some of the things that you just mentioned, which are immunological markers, how cells produce ATP, um, inflammation, and I wonder if you think there is sort of a broad benefit of using practices, and they are different for different people, that will allow individuals to enter this shift 
shifting physiological state and that potentially it can be curative for fatigue. It's been my experience, but I have had chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, I think very, very much so. And it's sometimes as simple as that. And it's sometimes many, many more ingredients, partly because there are other factors and partly because just switching off the maladaptive stress response for some people means dealing with multiple different pieces to be able to help that um, happen. But I think some of the a piece of research that I think is particularly um, interesting in this area is Dr. Robert Navio's work on cell danger response. And so to put it um, quite complex research, very, very, very simply, overly simplistically in some ways, um, the mitochondria, which are our sort of energy powerhouse in, in our cells, which in a sense is the mitochondria which are creating the, the absolute actual currency of energy. The mitochondria have two fundamental functions. The function people are most familiar with is this energy production function, but they also have a function of danger signaling that when the body is under threat, it is the job of the mitochondria to communicate within the cells within the body that we need to go into a um, stress response or an emergency response. So when we're in a stress state, beyond all the other things that people will imagine some will be familiar with, the impacts on digestive function, impacts upon um, hormone function, there's a very specific impact on cellular energy production when we are in a stress state. Our mitochondria actually shift from making energy to signaling danger to the rest of the system. So for energy production to be as efficient as we want it to be, we need to switch the body from that stress response, from what we call a maladaptive stress response into a healing state. Mm. I'd love to look up that research. Maybe uh, you can put it in the chat because I'd really like to look at this secondary feature of the mitochondria. So we just have a few minutes, by the way, before we're going to open up for Q&A. And I wanted to know if there was anything else that you wanted to share with the viewers about your experience, about what they should be doing now, um, rather than me just guiding it, because you have sure. such a wealth of information. You know, one of the th sort of just going back a little bit to where where we started, what I was saying about um, my own journey, that there is... I, I believe that the relationship between patient and practitioner is, is utterly critical and, and important. And there is often, but not always, for chronic fatigue cases, one needs to work with skilled practitioners, particularly when you're working with some of the more complex psycho-emotional issues, and particularly when you're working with I'm, I'm really not a big fan of people self-medicating supplements, for example, reading books and going, oh, vitamin, this and that is good. So I'm just going to go and buy a load. I really think people need to be testing levels of, of where, where their body's at before they start piling things in. So there is a, a critical place for working with practitioners, but that doesn't mean there isn't an enormous amount that people can do to help themselves. And that's really where we talk about this concept of, you need to become captain of the ship of your own recovery. You need to be as much as you're going to have, you know, various other people on your team. You're going to have hopefully a good um, functional, functional medicine informed nutritional therapist, a good psychology practitioner, a good yoga therapist or yoga teacher. You're going to have various people that are supporting and guiding this process. You're in those consultations collectively maybe three or four hours a month let's say so yes that guiding and steering is important but what you do the rest of the time that's what really is is where the rubber meets the road that's really where the change is going to happen and i think that being um i'm a really big fan of people being as educated as possible i mean i do a new video almost religiously five days a week on youtube um, I've broken my schedule today because I had to schedule this and I couldn't find a window elsewhere. Um, so, but generally speaking, Monday to Friday, um, every week I do either a live, I know I quite often do lives at the moment, um, when hopefully the internet connection doesn't drop out like it did earlier. Slightly embarrassing. Um, I, um, I also do filmed sessions. So we have a series that's been going for a few months now where I've been filming 
right real people having their sessions with me they've been then video diarying um, outside of those sessions and then we release those as episodes so every tuesday we do a, a new um what we call um, it's called in therapy as a series so people can watch other people going through their therapeutic journey people report getting so much because there's so much so many similarities so much then applies applies to themselves so be it via my content on um, YouTube and other places, um, be it other people's content isn't really the point that, that I'm, I'm wanting to make, but being proactive and taking responsibility for and taking the time to be educated on these different pieces, you can do so much with yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also enormously empowering and often flips the sense of kind of learned helplessness and um, kind of, a paralysis and powerlessness to a sense of being able to take steps and it might be a journey that takes a long time sometimes it might often it takes longer than at least than people want it to but you at least feel that you are having which you are a direct impact on that healing path mm -hmm. thank you so much and for those words of empowerment that other people should remember. And if they have the resources in terms of like the time resources right now to really be cultivating themselves with whatever they're presenting with, they should take that time. And that's so much about what Healthflix is about. Now, we have some questions that have already come in. Alex, you also know that I have a meeting and I have a feeling that people may want to ask you questions a little bit beyond when I have to log off. So I'm just going to make you host. So All right, I'm going to get some power here. It's exciting. <laughs> when I have to leave, I don't end the meeting and you have the freedom if you'd like to continue. But we have some questions that have come in both in the Q&A and also in the chat. Um, the first is, do you know how much, do you know much about the link between depression and fatigue? Will this be something you can touch on today? Yeah. Um, I didn't realize there was a chat and a Q&A function. That's quite clever. <laughs> I just pulled up both so I can see them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is a link, but I think the link is often quite misunderstood. So mm -hmm. I think the first thing I want to do is make a very clear distinction between depression and fatigue. So with depression, often the feeling is one wants to come out of the world and one wants to crawl into bed and crawl under the sheets and hide away from the world. That's often the feeling of depression, like we want to get away from the world. Often the feeling with fatigue is we want to come into the world, but we haven't got the energy to do that. So there is a different direction often in the two. If you're suffering from ongoing fatigue, you are likely to have a depletion and, and lower mood. That's a kind of almost inevitability of that. The difference, though, is if you're, if you're suffering from depression, um, exercise and moving your body will often help improve, even temporarily will help improve how you feel. If you, certainly if you have chronic fatigue, if you do more activity than you're able to do, it will make you feel worse. So the problem is when we lump kind of classical depression with sort of classical chronic fatigue in the same category and apply the same strategy, one group improve and one gets significantly worse. So that differentiation, I think, is, is quite important to make. Mm, okay, thank you. Another question comes from Liz Ailey. For those of us who fall into the achiever category, do you think getting better can become another thing to achieve? Uh, yes, <laughs> a simple answer to that question. In fact, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting because my um, my first book, I talked a lot about, and I touched on it earlier in the interview about taking like real responsibility for the healing process. And I went pretty hardcore in a sense down that, that path. And in the early days of the Optimum Health Clinic, we sort of promoted some other stories like that as well. And then what we sort of found was we had a we had a community of people. We were attracting achievers, and we were turning people into achievers because we were sort of promoting the idea that recovery is a result of how hard you work at it. And the result of that can be that actually you end up causing more stress trying to get well, and you actually make things worse, not better. But the other side of that is one often does, as I touched on a bit earlier, one does need to take responsibility. And that's the sort of being captain of the ship of your own recovery. So you have to find this quite 
delicate balance in a sense between being proactive, taking responsibility, being committed, and sometimes we have to make recovery at least temporarily the most important thing in, in our life, to not getting letting that become hijacked by that forcing, pushing, and achieve a pattern. And it's a it's quite a delicate balance that one has to find. And I think it's a constant thing that we're having to manage the dialectical tension of. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Another question we have here is, what is the title of the research article? Maybe you want to just, and can you send the links you mentioned? So maybe you want to type them into the chat. Let me, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a link. So Dr. Rabio's, Rabio's website, um, Dr. Navio's website has uh, a um uh, it has a category on the website which has links to um I'm not very good at talking and looking on the internet at the same time it has links to um okay. the publications um here we go so let me just find find that link um i also have a um three part video series where i break some of this down um as well okay so here is the link so i'm going to post this in the chat function right mm -hmm. Okay, on, on Zoom, to be clear. So that's a link. And there's another link here, uh, which is a, th a free three-part video series um, where I break some of this down in quite a lot more detail as well. So hopefully those are helpful. Great. Also, people want to know if you have published any other books and what the titles of those books are aside from Why Me. Um, so I'm, I'm a very um, poor author in as much as I published my first book at 23 and uh, the, I'm 40 this year and I'm finally, I have written a book in between an unpublished book that I decided not to publish for various reasons, um, but um, I am currently writing a book for Hay House um, on the what I, much of what I've been talking about today, so the, the approach to fatigue that I've uh, developed. Um, but the way book publishing works is I deliver that to the publisher in uh, July and it doesn't publish till May next year. Um, but that will be, yeah, that will be the place ultimately to go for that. Fantastic. Well, Alex, it's really been a pleasure to interview. You've interviewed me more than once and you are the interviewer extraordinaire. So Sorry, it's been interesting that. being on the other side. You did great. <laughs> well, thank you. And, re and really thank you for the work that you do in this world and for being willing to share with everybody else. I know how busy you are. And I wish you and your family continued wellness during this challenging time. Thank you. And to you. Um, did you want me to stay? I'm just trying to see if there are any unanswered questions if you wanted me to stay on. I think we're pretty much. I saw. Oh, yes. Here is one. You mentioned that adrenal fatigue is a controversial term. Why did you say that? So you can go to the Q&A and to the chat and back and forth and talk to people okay. and continue for as long as you'd like, actually. Okay. Well, I can stay on for another five minutes or so, so I'm happy to answer a few more. So, yeah. Brilliant. Take care, Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Thanks. Um, so just people in the Q&A, the links are in the chat. Um, so... Um, yeah, you should be able to see them there. Um, uh, so uh, David Perkins says, you mentioned adrenal fatigue is a controversial term. Um, uh, people not seeing the links. I don't know if I'm posting. Um, uh, okay, I think what I'll do is, um, oh, it's in all participants. Thank you, Joe. And um, let me see if I can work out how to do that. Uh, Okay, you guys are stretching my technical capacity here. I see, okay, I see what I need to do. Okay, so let me change that to all panelists and attendees. Okay, let me know guys if you can see uh, see those links now. Um, so David says, you mentioned adrenal fatigue. Great, thanks guys. Um, it's a controversial term, why did you say that? Um, well, there, <laughs> I don't know how far I wanna go down this, this rabbit hole, there is, in medical circles, there is um, limited evidence using um, uh, standard cortisol um, saliva tests as a as a predictor of um, hormone function. So there, those functional tests are um, there are some question marks in the medical community. Let's say 
there are then those in the sort of functional medicine or nutritional therapy world which rely heavily on those tests and i think perhaps sometimes draw two bigger conclusions from what those tests are we use them in a informative way where we use them as part of a bigger picture in terms of understanding what's happening and the kind of result of that of the idea of that there is adrenal fatigue i.e measurable by consistent low for example cortisol or dhea output is a sort of ambiguous piece let's say in terms of the research my slash our focus optimal health clinic is much more what is clinically effective and we must have performed you know well over a thousand i would imagine adrenal tests um, over the years and it's certainly helpful and certainly doing a wider adrenal protocol from looking at um, managing diet blood sugar calming the nervous system um, certain supplements be that um, glandulars or um, herbal formulations in some instances bioidentical hormones um, yeah that approach definitely is, is an important part of the picture but you always need to ask why is there, a, if, if we use the term adrenal fatigue, why is there adrenal fatigue um, in the first place? Um, just going back to questions. Um, what would you recommend to someone with intense fatigue and subclinical hyperthyroidism? Very low TSH and low T4. Um, so I think that's a good example. I'm not going to answer the question very specifically, but I think to answer it more generically, um, what I would say is the question is always why. So when these things are out of balance, we want to understand why they're out of balance. And some people, it is as simple as they have low thyroid output or over or overstimulated output, and you balance those very specifically, for example, with bioidentical hormones. But very often it's it's a symptom of an imbalance elsewhere in the system. And following that thread and getting that clarity, um, that's where you need to go. Um, and there are lots of pieces to that that jigsaw um, that I think can be important. But I think it's it's not taking a symptom diagnosis as a true diagnosis. It's saying that that's the question is why is that um, is that happening? Um, uh, Liz says, I experience fatigue as a result of chronic migraine. Would you class this as part of the fatigue syndrome? Um, so I certainly wouldn't give any diagnosis um, in this context. Um, anyone with fatigue before going down um, a integrative medicine or functional medicine path um, should always go down a traditional um, uh, medical path first. There are many things that can cause fatigue, which are um, things that, that that should be and need to be addressed from a traditional perspective. So you always need to get that clarity first. Um, but often fatigue and migraines can go together. Um, and um, again, the question is why? What's underneath that? They are symptoms. What's the thing that's uh, causing or uh, triggering that? Um, uh, any other questions? Let's have a look. Um, Uh, Joe is saying there seems to be a glitch in the link. Uh, let me just check the link that I posted. Uh, if anyone's struggling on the link, the best thing to do would be to search um, cell danger response research. Um, that will get you where you're trying to get to. Um, and in terms of my video series, if you go to alexhoward.tv slash reset, um, I think that's rather than me spending more time searching for links. I think you'll, you'll get there anyway uh, doing that. Um, so I think that's pretty much, I'm just scrolling back through. I think that's pretty much all the questions um, covered. Um, oh, uh, Dion says, um, I batch with CFS. Do you suggest one to pace themselves? Um, absolutely. Um, part of getting the body in a healing state is you have to listen to the body. And sometimes pacing oneself means doing significantly less activity um, than you might be wanting to do and that whole piece of figuring out how much you do is its own um, its own journey and its own piece um, without wanting to sound overly self-promotional do check out um, uh, the uh, there's a lot of content on my youtube channel um, and there's a lot of live videos that i do 
Um, but there's also, there must be over a hundred videos, well over a hundred videos in there now. So a lot of these questions are also, you'll find much more context rather than 30 second answers, you'll find sort of much more full answers. So hopefully, oh, hang on, I missed a tab. <laughs> Some more here. Um, let's have a look. Um, Uh, Julie says, I'm confused when you say take control of your own recovery, but don't take supplements on your own. Well, there's many other pieces, I think, I guess what I'm saying, Julie, that you can influence on the recovery journey that you can do by yourself. Things to um, calm your nervous system, rest your body, deal with things in your life that are overloading you. Um, there are often dietary changes one can make relatively easily. Um, and it doesn't mean that someone needs to spend thousands of pounds with a practitioner to get clarity. It's often cheaper to work with a practitioner to find out what your body actually needs than it is to self-medicate a load of supplements that end up costing you a lot of money and actually not necessarily having um, an impact and can actually increase toxicity and load um, in the system. Um, and finally, um, someone says, can you say something about fatigue and waking up not refreshed? Um, yeah, that's basically a sign of there not being enough energy in the system. And you get sleep at night and your body is just not restoring enough. Um, and uh, often hormones are at play there. So um, low morning um, cortisol, DHEA and such things. Um, often people aren't getting refreshing sleep because the body's in a state of maladaptive uh, stress response. Um, and, you know, if you have fatigue, you're often going to have fatigue at the start of the day and, and right through the day. Need to figure out why, but these core principles um, hopefully have been helpful as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. I hope that was helpful. Um, if you want to find out more, best place to go, two places. One, my website. You'll find links to a lot of the vlogs that I do, um, alexhoward.tv, and also the Optimum Health Clinic, which is a, a registered UK charity that I founded. It has a team of 20 full-time practitioners specializing in fatigue, theoptimumhealthclinic.com. So simply the optimumhealthclinic.com. You can order a free information pack there, um, which we'll post to you in the UK or you can get digitally internationally. You can also book a free 15 minute chat with one of the psychology team, one of the nutrition team. It's a great way to find out more about how the approach might be helpful um, for you. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and yeah, look forward to talking to people at some point in the future.